Hey, hi, and welcome to another episode of the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Marina Buxov, and today I have with me pharmacist turned mindset and business coach, and his name is Dr. Eugene Choi. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Marina. It's such a pleasure. Yes. So I would love to dive deeper into your journey. And first of all, can you tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up, and how you came to be a pharmacist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I moved to New York City from Korea when I was 11 months old. Uh, and basically, long story short, grew up there in Queens, uh, in Long Island. And I went into pharmacy school um, for the money, honestly. <laughs> Um, you know, at the time in the Korean newspapers, when I was in high school, um, everything was talking about how pharmacy is the best job to have right then and there. Cause they're offering like $20,000, $30,000 sign on bonuses and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in New York, you know, there's a six year track with the schools that we have right at Long Island yeah. university or St. John's, um, which I didn't know until later that everywhere else does eight years. Um, but yeah, like, you know, six years you go to school and then you get a six figure salary and all that kind of stuff. Um, so honestly, that's kind of why I went into pharmacy um, and it was stable and it was a six year program. And unfortunately, by the time I graduated, it was already saturated by then. Um, there were like no jobs out there, but I did land a nice hospital job over at Winthrop Hospital in, in Long Island. And it's kind of how I got into pharmacy. Wow. Well, I really appreciate the candor. And, you know, I think that's definitely one of the factors, probably one of the most important factors that people consider when choosing a career. So uh, thank you for your honesty. It was definitely one of my considerations as well. And at the time, my dad was pulling up the, you know, best career charts too, and showing me that it's the best career. So I, I went for it too. But as you said, by the time we graduated, that was no longer the case. And it's just continuing to get worse and worse. So everybody kind of has to pivot and figure out what can they do to fit out and stand out and um, specialize in something different. So which school did you end up going to here in New York? And then how was your journey like in school? Like what interested you? Um, what did you feel like you would specialize in? Or maybe did you fall out of love and ph with pharmacy right away? Or how did that kind of um, journey and then right after graduation, how was your career journey right then? Yeah, it was, it was really tough. Um, so, you know, I grew up in a struggling immigrant family, no money, that kind of stuff. So I was working uh, no less than three jobs at a time while I was in school. So for me, priority was just past classes, <laughs> honestly, wow. right? I, um, I wasn't the most studious student, um, but it was really tough. You know, it's a lot of memorization. Um, and for me, I learned best with applications. So for me, rotations were the most fun, right? Yeah. I'm talking with doctors, learning from residents, teaching things to residents and watching the medicine, you know, take effect in the patient live right then and there in the ICUs when I was there. Um, yeah, I geared towards a lot of critical, med um, critical care, emergency room medicine, toxicology. Um, and I studied at St. John's University out in Queens in Jamaica. So high five. <laughs> high five. Yeah. So <laughs> that's where I was. Yeah. So I, I think we we're like, uh, I think you graduated like two years after me or three years after me. I forget, but um, yeah, I'm yeah, a that, class of 2013. Nice. Yeah. You were there after all the new fountains and the new buildings. <laughs> I was just like, is this where all our money's going? But anyway, um, but yeah, like, uh, so I, I geared towards things like critical medicine, ICU. Um, it was just fun for me because that's when you see like the most immediate results in the right because it's just like urgent. Yeah. you need to do something right then and there um so that's kind of how i how my career spanned out too so i did a lot of hospital uh i was i did emergency room medicine i was in the trauma centers uh and and the icus like the icu pharmacy for the icu satellites yeah i think it's rewarding like you're saying to see the effects of your work you know right there and playing out and saving lives uh, but I feel like it's very also stressful, you know, and adrenaline driven, you have to really be quick with your decisions and quick with your job and make, you know, not make any mistakes and just make critical judgments every day, like every second of the day. So that must have been really stressful. Yeah, I mean, it definitely gets you burnt out after a while, um, unless you're an adrenaline junkie, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, for me, I was always in go, go, go mode. Um, 
just just because of like the financial hardships growing up. So I think that's kind of where I got that sense of like satisfaction temporarily from that kind of work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're just on a high at that time, but and in New York, I feel like that's also just our status quo and everybody's kind of like on that A-type personality and go-getter wavelength. So it, it kind of seems normal if everybody around you is also go, go, go. It really does. And you're right. You know, I, I'm not in New York anymore, but, you know, it was until after I left New York and I did a lot more traveling, I realized like, well, New York's kind of a bubble <laughs> of that <laughs> hustle it felt almost normal to be always too busy if you're not yeah. busy then something's wrong with it feels like something's wrong with you um yeah and to be cranky right there's a lot of cranky new yorkers uh, not everyone right but you know like yeah. that's kind of like our our reputation i guess and there's a little bit of truth to it yeah give me coffee you know for me to right. not be cranky <laughs> right right exactly and honestly i was just tired of being stressed all the time so I, that's where I eventually kind of left New York. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, you know, choosing that kind of hospital high paced uh, career, and then how did you move from job to job? And then eventually, why did you choose to leave New York? And eventually, yeah. why did you leave pharmacy? Yeah, absolutely. So honestly, I, after working three years, I was working as a full-time pharmacist at uh, as a clinical pharmacist at Winthrop Hospital, also had uh, per diem at a mom and do mom and pop shop and worked at CVS per diem. Um, so all of that kind of stuff was happening. And I really got burnt out, honestly. Uh, I was working a lot. I got I got all of those things I thought I wanted, right? You know, because you're having a stable career and stable salary and all that kind of stuff. So we had the brand new apartment. I had the nice sports car, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, six-figure salary. Uh, I got burnt out and... Uh, this is more from a personal standpoint where it was just like, I kind of don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I remember having a conversation with a coworker at the hospital and she was there for like, I think 20, 30 plus years. She's like a veteran. And I was just trying to make conversation with her one day. I'm just like, wow, how long have you been working here? And she's like, oh, you know, like 25, 30 years. I'm like, wow, you must've seen a lot of things here. Like over the years, she's like, not really. I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, it's pretty much you just do the same thing every day. <laughs> and I'm looking at, I'm like, I do not want to be there in 30 years. <laughs> no. um, so that's kind of where I was trying to really start exploring because I knew I wanted to help people. I knew I at least wanted to provide some sort of service. And it was great. Like clinically, I was providing service. And then, you know, in the pharmacy world, we're still trying to make a lot of progress there it's it's changed a lot over the years i'll acknowledge that but back when i was there it was very like you know pharmacists really didn't partake as much in the clinical conversation mm -hmm. i kind of had to prove myself worthy right where i'm like proactively talking to doctors a lot of pharmacists were scared to like have conversations with them and question their decisions uh, but i had to learn how to do that right and study a lot for that but um, long story short, I got burnt out, realized I was just like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And at the time I was kind of getting into uh, filmmaking. So okay. I was getting into filmmaking. I would make these fun little comedic videos for my friends and stuff like that. So that led to friends asking me to make videos for their weddings, like little fun sketches and things uh -huh. like that. So I was pretty good at it. People really liked them. And then that's when I got connected with this group, uh, Jubilee Media. So it was started by these three Asian Americans and they, long story short, they invited me to join their team when they decided to start full time. Wow. So the reason I said yes was they left behind more prestigious careers than me. So wow. the first guy, his name was Eddie, and he was, um, he was a Harvard student, uh, wow. graduated, uh, worked on Obama's campaign. And when Obama got elected, they hired him to the White House. So he was uh, one of the youngest directors at the time in the White House. Wow. He quit to make videos on YouTube, basically was their vision. Make positive videos on YouTube that makes a difference, whatever that looks like, right? Uh -huh. um, then his younger brother, who was also part of the three, he graduated Wharton, you know, top business school, uh, got into Bain Consulting, which is one of the top consulting firms, quit that job. And the third guy was a Harvard med student, decided to go on hiatus to make these videos online and they moved to LA to do it full time because they were making a little bit of progress. So I was, I was like, I have no excuse. Like they left, like, how can I say I can't quit my job when these guys <laughs> quit something even crazier? 
So that's what made me say yes. Um, Cause in the Asian community, this is like, Unheard for, a of. Of, for a lot of Asian immigrant parents, they're like, you know, some of them will even disown you for making decisions like that, leaving behind stable. I'm you know, sure. Persons, right. So, so I did it. Um, I asked my wife, I was just like, what do you think? Try this thing out. We'll go on a two month long uh, cross country road trip to LA, move there and work with these guys for a little bit, see how it goes. And she said, okay. Um, so we spent the two, two months on the road, just walk, going on a nice road trip, looking at everything that we wanted to look at. It was the time of our lives. It was like a once in a lifetime thing. I didn't know America was so beautiful. Um, we traveled a lot, but um, didn't realize how beautiful America was too. So uh, that's kind of how I ended up there. And that's where I learned a lot about marketing. Um, so, you know, some of the videos I've worked on went viral. My biggest project made 23 million views. We worked with various celebrities, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of when I fell in love with um, how do you spread an idea to make mm -hmm. an impact? Mm -hmm. So that snowballed into us not having any money left because everyone was living off our savings. So it literally right. had $5 left in my bank account. So I was just like, all right, fine. Oh. I'll have to go back to pharmacy because <laughs> I, I had my license. So I transferred my license, um, got into another hospital in LA. And uh, that's kind of when I went into that's when I was like a little bit depressed, honestly. I was just like, I can't figure this thing out. I want to figure out whatever my, you know, finding my passion looks like, quote unquote, all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking a lot about it. I was just like, um, whatever, fine. Might as well do something I like doing within pharmacy if I can. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was leadership. So I was just like, all right, fine. I'll um, see if I can be a supervisor. I had no supervisor experience at the time, right? So I'm walking around asking the supervisor. I'm like, how do you get your job? Like, what did you do? <laughs> And they're like, we just applied. Uh, and for most of them, it's just because they were there long enough and they trust the leaders trusted them. Um, but long story short, I was fortunate enough to get a position as a supervisor. So here I am. I was a supervisor for all of LA County, six major hospitals, 250 oh. clinics uh, in the IT department. And I was a supervisor in the IT department. You know, we're the ones where, you know, whatever software you use, we're the ones that maintain like that formulary and make sure uh -huh. the doctors, you know, doctors and pharmacists are doing everything correctly. So I was doing that because I took this job because um, I got my wife got pregnant. So we had no benefits. So I was just like, all right, I'll take it. Initially, I was overnight, hated that. So that's when I tried to get into a supervisor position, got that supervisor position with no experience. Um, apparently, they chose me over other people who had much more experience because they liked my um, experiences with like, you know, entrepreneurship and learning and all that kind of stuff Yeah. and leadership skills. And so, yeah, I became a supervisor really cushy job. I don't know if you know this, California is the highest paying state. So this is the most money I've, I, I was making close to like 200,000 a year by that point oh. as a supervisor. And then um, had a second kid by then. And I fell into that depression again. I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life. It was a really cushy job. I was a supervisor on paper, but I wasn't supervising any, anyone. All the people that we were working with reported to their clinic or their hospital. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the yeah. second thing that was nice was I worked in a building with all IT people. There was no yeah. healthcare professionals. So I could like, <laughs> not that I did this, but like, I could totally just make stuff up and they'll be like, okay, sure. <laughs> Cause like, you know, they don't understand the medical stuff, but it was a really nice job. And I just remember sitting there. I was just like, I don't want to be the parent that tells their kid how to live their life. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I want to be the parent that shows them how to live it through my life. So I knew I was passionate about helping people, serving people, really activating people's gifts, right? Helping them yeah. find out what their gifts, their potential is. So that's when I was thinking about filmmaking. I was just like, well, I hated the act of filmmaking. Cause just to give you an idea, the 23 million view video that we made, um, took me seven months to edit it. Wow. The process is not fun. Um, even though they got really big now, Jubilee media got over like 7 million subscribers now today. Um, and they got pretty big, but I realized, what is it that I like then? I was just like, why do we even like movies and stories? Why do, as adults, why do we sit in a dark room and be told a story essentially? And it's because it's a story about transformation. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, oh, that's what I like. That's what I'm fascinated by. It's like, what is it, what actually creates change? Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to study. And that's where I got to where I'm at today, which is, that's when I discovered neuroscience. I was just like, wait, hold on. Like science and personal development, they actually merge. Um, yeah. So that's why I discovered neuroscience turns out, 
you know, there's a specific part of your brain, you know, it's your prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead. It's where all your superpowers come from, basically. It's where your creativity comes from, your critical thinking skills, your problem solving skills, your money making skills. And based on research, it's shown that it's turned off for about 70% of our adult lives. Like it's literally shut off uh, because of, the fight, flight, yeah, because of the fight, flight, freeze response when you're in a survival state. Uh, Cause okay. research shows that we're triggered by the stress response about 70% of our adult lives. So that's when we enter into this reactive state mm. where we're reacting without thinking, right? Fight, flight, freeze. Right. Mm. Um, so when I found this out, I'm just like, why doesn't, why doesn't anyone talk about this? <laughs> I was like, how do people not know this? Like, this is so simple. Like, I, I'm like, if you just look at this, if you just get yourself out of fight flight, you can access your gifts. You can access your talents. You can access your critical thinking skills, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's when I started this journey of like, all right, I need to figure out a way to actually apply this to people's lives and see if it works. So that's when I um, coughed up money, invested in a business coach. I'm like, I really got to figure this out. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot. And over those years, I for the first thing I did was like I would organize these little retreats where it's just like find your passion type of thing. Like I'll you uh -huh. know, I'll teach you what I learned through all my experiences. And even though it felt very vague, like what I was promising, um, people came. I had people flying from all over the country. I organized this nice little retreat at a at a beach town in in LA, um, and they came for a few days and went through my process. I had like influencers come. I I leveraged my network. Um, from my filmmaking days to come and inspire them and all that. Uh, and it worked. People were getting more clarity around their lives. And I was just like, how do I make this even more clear? How do I make this even more effective? Uh, and that's when I just went much more deeper into the science. It's really, really all about developing the skill to get yourself out of that survival state. Because your brain is only in one or the other. It's either in a survival state or what I call an executive state, mm. where all of your superpowers come from, right? So that's essentially how I built my business from the ground up. Cause what happened was I was getting a lot of attention online because I started writing. I, I, I learned a little bit about writing, you know, I had over a million views on my articles in less than a year. Influencers were sharing some of my articles. Um, I got published on some of the top personal development platforms in the world. And uh, that helped me get a business coaching position with the company that I hired them to be my business coach. So they offered me a oh, job. Nice. So I got direct training from a CEO that's built a multi-million dollar business from the ground up on business strategy. Wow. And I was coaching like anywhere between 25 to 28 clients at a time uh, in any given period over like a year and a half. Um, and then while I was doing that, I learned a lot about business. So I was able to apply it to my business. And then that's when my business started taking off the following year. Like I had an article that went viral, 7 million views online. Um, and it just started taking off. I created this process that brings people step by step um, through this process that teaches them how to actually, at will, you can turn on that part of the brain that we're talking about where it creates, where you activate your critical thinking skills, your problem solving skills, so that people can get their highest levels of energy, clarity, and focus. Wow, that's amazing. So it's kind of like a switch and you just have to know the keys to activate it off fight or flight freeze and onto creativity and executive state? Yeah, in a, it's a yes and no. So yes, it is a skill because it's only one or the other. That's the, that was the fascinating thing I found. It's just like, you're, there's only two states that you're ever in. It's that survival state or the executive state. So once people start bringing awareness, like this is kind of where mindfulness comes in, right? Like once mm -hmm. you're aware, like, wait, hold on. Like, you're right. Like, 70% of my, I can see why 70% of my life I'm in survival. Right. I'm in some sort of fight, flight, freeze response. Once the awareness is there, um, that's when you can start really shifting things. The deeper work is that a majority of this behavior is actually not conscious. It's subconscious. Like your brain's doing it automatically. Right. Because of all of the experiences we carry throughout our lives, the unique experiences we carry, there's certain programming and conditioning in our brain to behave a certain way if that makes sense. Yeah. So the flip the switch part, yes, it's possible to an extent. And then where the work gets deeper is where you start looking under, under the hood of what's going <laughs> right. on in the subconscious and start rewiring that as well. So yeah, like it's, it's really an awareness building thing. I think the biggest aha for a lot of people is, you know, fight, flight, freeze response isn't just, it's meant for when your life's in danger, when you're about to die, right? Like if there's a wild animal about to eat you. But if you think about it, it plays out every single day for everyone. 
um, what does fight response look like? Remember, it's reacting without thinking. Uh, this happened in New York a lot, right? You get cut off on the road and that person flips their <laughs> and they're pissed off and they're trying to cut the other person back off. That's a classic fight response. He's lost his logic and rationale and he's dangerously trying to catch this guy back and cutting everyone else off on the road, right? That's a fight response, right? Because his ego got hurt, right? It's usually a defense of the ego. Um, for some people, it's overworking because they feel the need to prove themselves to someone. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, it's like, that means for you, for someone to have the need to prove themselves, it means there's something about themselves that they don't like in, to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. I don't feel I'm good enough. I don't feel I'm smart enough. I don't feel I'm, so you're fighting, right? Fight, fight, freeze. You're fighting by overworking, even though you're not taking care, self-care is out the window by then. And that leads to burnout and unfulfillment. You know, I was there, that's what I did, right? Um, you know, I grew up poor, so I, my whole life was to fight for money. And when you get the money, it's just like, why am I still unhappy, right? Yeah. Um, happened to me. And then, you know, people fight like that. And I coach people in their fifties and sixties and they don't realize it until we do this work where they're like, oh my God, yeah, my whole life, everyone compared to me, me to my older brother. So that's why I felt the need to fight all the time to prove myself. No wonder I'm not happy, even though I have all these things now. Um, so that's a fight response. So it's emotional survival now. It's not physical survival anymore. It's emotional survival. But we get triggered by emotional survival because research shows emotional pain is just as pa painful as physical pain. Absolutely. Flight response is things like procrastination. You want to avoid the problem, right? You want to avoid this feeling. Um, so a lot of people do flight response. Staying busy is a flight response, right? <laughs> yeah. Try to keep yourself busy. Uh, where it gets pretty bad is when you numb yourself. Mm. Uh, some people like to binge watch Netflix. Some people like to eat a tub of ice cream when they're not feeling good. Other people like to overindulge in things like alcohol, sex, drugs. Everyone has a numbing behavior that they prefer, that they like, no judgment around it. It's just being more aware of it, right? Everyone has a flight response, right? Uh, kind of like you're withdrawn. And then there's freeze, which is inaction. Uh, the biological thing is playing dead, right? You know how animals <laughs> play dead, hoping the threat goes away. It's the same yeah. thing for humans. Like if you get caught in a lie, you kind of freeze, don't you? Or uh, it usually happens a lot when there's too many decisions to make, too much pressure. So you kind of get overwhelmed and then you freeze. So when people start seeing like, hey, can you see how every time you're doing this fight, flight, freeze response, you're actually disconnected yeah. from the part of your brain that you need to be able to solve the challenge or overcome the challenge. But that's the problem to begin with. So the moment we start seeing that, that's what I bring people through. And then we can start working on the deeper work there so that they can finally get that result that they're looking for, whether it's in their business or in their personal life. Wow. That was a long wind. I feel like I'm talking way too much right no, now. No, I love it. I'm just like soaking it all in. I love to learn about people's processes and your work just seems so fascinating. And you seem to have created your own unique process to bring yeah. people through. So it's really fascinating. And you drew from a lot of your own trainings and experiences. Yeah. So like what was mind blowing was personal development doesn't need to be woo woo anymore. Nothing against woo woo, right? Like, you know, what I call like woo woo. Um, yeah. Cause those are, there are a lot of truths behind that. It's just, it can be explained now where it makes sense to like the more overly logical person, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's who I work with a lot more are these high performers who are very logical. They're very talented, very intelligent. Um, but emotionally, right. There's still stuff going on there, right? Like they're just not feeling good. So what was fascinating about the science was that what I started doing was number one is just the process in itself of bringing that awareness. There's a lot of mindfulness, right? Like I, I do require my clients to meditate and I give them all that. Um, I give them technology. So what was exciting was also technology. So the thing I hated about personal development, I don't know if you ever had this experience is you might go to some inspiring event or hear a motivational speaker and it feels great, right? Yeah. When you go through it. And then you go home and what happens? You're like, yeah, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then maybe a few days passes and the adrenaline rush goes away, right? Yeah. And then it's like back to normal because your surroundings are still the same. So you just kind of go back to your routine. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Like, how do we actually create change? So that's when technology came, uh, comes in really handy. So there's technology, because remember I said there's only two states that you're ever in, survival or executive, and executive yeah. is where you want to be. There's technology that can measure what state you're in. So I used um, neurofeedback and biofeedback. So neurofeedback, I don't know if you ever heard of the Muse headband. It's a, well, I, I heard it from you when we yeah. first spoke. Yeah, but before that, no. So it's, it's really fascinating. Yeah, so 
you know, if there's pharmacists in this audience, it's basically a portable EEG device. It'll measure your brain waves. And based yeah. on what it's reading, it will tell you what state you're in. So um, the survival state brainwave, specifically, it's called a high beta brainwave. So what's associated with this? It's overthinking, right? Overanalytical, paranoia, anxiety. Sound familiar, right? This is like survival yeah. emotions, right? So imagine, this is how it works. Uh, neurofeedback is like, imagine you're listening to uh, a soundtrack. It'll, it might play Calm, Peaceful Rain, for example. Mm -hmm. so what it's telling you is just like, hey, you're in the types of brain waves that's a meditative state, right? This is where your critical thinking skills can turn on and all that good stuff, right? Your superpowers. Yeah. But the moment you start stressing, like you're worried about that annoying coworker, right? <laughs> or you're thinking about all the things you have to get done today. The moment it shifts into that brain wave, it's going to turn into a thunderstorm. Wow. So it's signaling to you, hey, you're in survival state right now. Come back. Let's get back. Let's get out of it. So you're, you're able to develop this mental muscle, just like a physical trainer can help you develop your muscles physically view this as like a, a mental personal trainer to help you develop your muscle mentally. Cause the more you do this, it becomes muscle memory, right? In neuroscience, there's something called implicit memory. Uh, what that type of memory is, is, you know, how you can learn how to ride a bike and imagine for 10 years, you don't ride the bike. And then you get back on after 10 years, you remember how to write it. You remember. <laughs> that's implicit memory. It's like you remember the feeling of it. So that's what this device trains you to do is you just remember whenever you sense survival state, whether it's stress, anxiety, worry, depression, you can you know that you can just with your muscle memory just get out of it. That's what it's training you to do. Does that make sense? Instead of just trying to sit there and analyze and think through it, you, you just it's just a muscle. You're just able to get out of it because I know this is not serving me right now. If I'm not being, if I'm not about to be murdered, I know that I don't need this right now. And you just get out of it. Yeah. So that's when these breakthroughs happen in clients when they develop this skill. So the second piece of technology I use is something called a, a bio strap. I don't know if we're going to be on video, but it's, it's this little yeah. thing on my wrist. Um, so this is biofeedback where uh, it's kind of like a Fitbit and measures all those vital signs and all that good stuff. But one thing this device measures that a lot of other devices don't is your HRV. So that stands for your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So it's the variability uh, in time between the heartbeats that it's measuring, right? And what this indicates is which part of your nervous system is more dominant. So remember, brain is only in one of two states. Same thing with your nervous system. You have a parasympathetic and you have a sympathetic. So sympathetic right. nervous system is your survival responses, right? Fight, flight, freeze, right? Everything is accelerating, your heartbeat's going and all that kind of stuff. And then you have your parasympathetic, which is the brakes, right? It slows everything down. So it's, we, need to be, we need to have our parasympathetic nervous system more dominant uh, in order for us to be in that executive state. And then total side note, you need your parasympathetic for your body to heal, to be in homeo yeah. homeostasis. So people who I know that have autoimmune conditions or like eczema flare-ups all the time, when they teach themselves to relax, it's like magic. They're like, why is it? You know, I went to the doctor so many times telling them and they're saying all the labs look normal. Yeah. But it's a result of what state they're keeping themselves in that it just kind of manifests all that kind of stuff. And as soon as they teach themselves how to relax, there's a ton of research around this, but you know, as soon as they teach themselves how to relax, boom, their body gets better too. So anyway, um, I measure the HRV to show them like, look, something you're doing actually improves your body too. So high uh, HRV readings are popular amongst athletes mm -hmm. because athletes are put their body under a lot of stress. So in between training, they need to teach themselves how to relax so that their body can recover faster, right? right? So they teach themselves things like meditation. So when I teach clients with the brain training, just to show them, I'm like, I want you to measure your HRV while you're meditating. Okay. So anything below a, a 20 millisecond value, it means your sympathetic's more dominant, mm -hmm. right? So as adults, anywhere between 30 to 80 or 90 is the average that we want to aim for as a baseline, right? Everyone has different baselines, um, but just to give you a range, when I have them do these meditations and record their HRVs, I've had clients that went over 200, wow. meaning they're just deeply in that parasympathetic. Um, wow. And they're just, their bodies in homeostasis, their brains performing and all that kind of stuff. And then you feel it, you feel the difference. So anyway, yeah. So that's the piece of technology I use to make sure I ensure results. Like, I don't want this to just be some lofty kind of thing where I'm just trying to be your cheerleader and make you feel motivated all the time. It's like, no, like things you do actually have an effect on yourself, your brain and your body. And I'm here to show it to you with the technology. So yeah, it's a great coaching tool because it makes it less awkward for me to call them out. 
right? It's like, <laughs> How are you doing? I'm feeling great. It's like, well, your HRV levels have been like below 20 for the past month. Like what's really going on? I'm, I'm, I'm able to call them out on it, right? So it's, yeah, it's, it's been some powerful tools for that where I use technology and coaching to make sure I produce results in clients. Wow. So it's kind of like this tool that allows the person to be like more sure and more connected to their body, but also seeing the results and having it be just more credible rather than the theory behind it. It's just like they're seeing it in front of them and Correct. it's much easier to believe in something that's measured out rather than like the theory yep. behind it. Especially CEOs, like CEOs <laughs> love having toys to play with, right? Um, because it shows actual metrics, right? Right. Care a lot about metrics. So yeah, I show that. It's validity. It's, you know, credibility right. and validity. And what's cool is it helps people feel validated too. Right. Because a lot of stress is an emotional experience, isn't it? And it's hard to put that into words sometimes, right? Uh -huh. Whether you're dissatisfied with certain things or you're questioning certain things about life. And it's really hard to put that into words. And it's, it, it really helps validate people going like, okay, I'm not crazy. Uh, I can trust my body when I'm experiencing these emotions because it's trying to communicate something with me. What is it trying to communicate? And they're more open to having that kind of conversation uh, when we use these tools, when we're having coaching conversations around it so that they can really start getting clarity around what their gifts are, what they really care about, what path they want to go down. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up here because you know, your body is the first thing to respond to information. Like, that's think about it, right? Yeah. We need our, we need our amygdala. Uh, when you're in front of a, a danger that can kill your life, you don't need your brain to react. You need your body to react to yeah. save your life. So our body is so sensitive to information. So the body is more reliable. If you're not feeling good, it means there's something going on here. There's survival going mm -hmm. on. And for a lot of people, they carry it for years and decades and think it's just a normal part of their daily life when it doesn't have to be. So that's where I like the body work is important to me too. So it's just like just helping people tune into their bodies where it's, there's reasons why you might be feeling certain things. It's not coming from nowhere. It, this is not natural or normal if you're not feeling good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. This is so fascinating. I'm really curious. Can you show us the tools? Do you have the headband too? And I do. also, so when you mentioned the sound of rain and the thunderstorm, so do people actually hear it, you know, yeah. or you put some they, headphones on. Okay. So you, you use it with headphones and do you use it throughout the day or is it just like periodically? Oh, uh, just whenever you want for meditation sessions. Okay. So you're meditating while you have it. So it's this little guy here. So mm -hmm. you can see like all the sensors are right here. It's the okay. same thing as the and then you put right? it on. It's not as advanced as when you go to like a sleep center, obviously, because it's portable. Uh, and then you just put it on your head like this okay. and it'll measure your brain waves when you activate it. So you use it with a smartphone to turn connected to Bluetooth to make the mm -hmm. neurofeedback start working. Um, yeah. And then you just, it's, you just do a meditation session and you might be hearing, um, yeah, like rain. There's different sounds you can choose, right? Some people like waves at the beach. Uh, and then if you're entering into survival state, it just becomes more violent. So it's okay. kind of signaling to you like, Hey, come back, come back. <laughs> we don't need to be in fight flight right now, unless you're actually going to die. Uh -oh. So how do people actually use the technology? Is it when they're turned on and documenting and doing the metrics and then it downloads it somewhere and then both the person and the practitioner they're working with can take a look at the data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the muse, I don't use it um, for that. I just use, have the uh, clients use it for themselves because okay. unless they've changed things, there wasn't a way for me to monitor it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they might have some sort of beta program going on, but I'm not a part of it. Um, but you can share the results. Like I have clients send it to me like, look, look at how long my uh, calm state was today. It's usually okay. this little, but now I was able to do it for like 15 minutes. Um, so I, I just provide it to clients as a tool for like, have fun with it. Like, I don't want this to feel like it's homework. Yeah. Um, and you know it's working when you're having fun with it because it feels damn good. <laughs> you condition your body to want that more, right? Like, yeah, you know, that's just reward. part of our natural. Yeah. Exactly. It's the reward centers. So it should be an enjoyable experience. It should be fun. Um, and then when you get the hang of this, yeah, like why wouldn't you want to go into a meditation where you come out feeling great? That's why I do at least 60 to 90 minutes now every day, right? Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. I can go deeper into that too, but like, it's really cool. Yeah. So that's, that's what I use for clients, but the bio strap, 
um, I, I do follow clients. Like it has an ability, a function where with your practitioner, you can monitor it together. So like I can take any of my clients that I follow and I just pull up their HRV readings for a particular day, uh, time period over time. And is that something that's always constantly on or is it also like on and off it's, periods? Yeah, it's, it's up to the client. Um, the time it's read the most is during your sleep cycle, your HRV. Like you want to, you want to identify what your baseline is right. as opposed, it's not like a scoring game. You want to see what your baseline is and see the things that you do, how it affects your baseline. Mm. So I have them do it during, uh, I have them wear it during their sleep if they can, just to get their baseline. Mm -hmm. And then I have them record it during a meditation. Okay. But then the rest is up to them. I wear it pretty much all the time, but it's, it's up to the client. Now, does the client have to buy this specific tool or do they rent it or how does that? Oh, you can buy it. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what the current prices are, um, but for the Muse headband, this, there's three versions. I, I buy the second version for clients when, I, when they sign up for a package with me. And that's like 200, I think like 230, 240. Okay. retail price and then the bio strap i think the latest version right now is around that point too um yeah i have i have like those affiliate links with discounts if you guys if you want for your audience yeah, to provide that yeah we, we can do that in the show notes for sure yeah because i've uh, partnered with them and all that good stuff but yeah um, that's what they do now what about the actual tools or trainings that they can use to put them from sympathetic to parasympathetic is that something that you coach them in Yes. So I introduce a lot of the science and how to apply the science. So uh, one small thing I do in a lot of my presentations is something called a, like, like an executive state training. Like mm -hmm. what are some ways you can do that? Uh, I can give four quick tips if you want. That's of helpful course, I love that. So tip number one is understanding. Number one is the cheat sheet is you're going to be in a survival state if it doesn't feel good. Because okay. remember emotional discomfort, right? Emotional pain has been shown to be just as painful as physical pain. So that's the cheat sheet. Emotions like anxiety, depression, frustration, anger, all of these things will trigger that fight, flight, freeze response where you're literally not thinking anymore, right? You're just <laughs> reacting. Um, so that's the thing to know is to be aware of. So how do you get yourself out of that? It's important to label your emotions, right? So how this, how this has been uh, proven to be effective is they had a research study done with a group of individuals. They had the brain scans tied to their heads and the uh, researchers would show a picture of a person's face with a survival emotion on it, right? So an angry face, an anxious face, a fearful face. And as soon as they show the video, uh, uh, sorry, the, the photo, guess what happens? The amygdala turns on, right? That's where your fight, flight, freeze response comes from, the survival state. And then they're like, okay, that's normal. So then the researcher would ask the participant, can you tell me what emotion you're seeing in this photo? And it's easy to identify, right? So they're like, oh yeah, this person's angry or this person is sad or this person is anxious. Soon as they name the emotion, guess what happened? Amygdala turned off, prefrontal cortex turned on, right? Their executive state turned on. Why does that happen? Remember, when you're in fight, not even that. Remember when you're in fight flight, you can't think. Yeah. You're literally not thinking. So to label emotion requires you to think about what emotion mm -hmm. you're seeing. So by labeling the emotion, you're calling on your prefrontal cortex to activate, and now you're out of your fight, flight, freeze response. So wow. this is where for clients, the quick tip is just, yeah, make it a habit. Label your emotions. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling angry. And the nuance here is important because there's a, I learned this from a clinical psychologist friend of mine. There's a difference between I am sad and I feel sad. So it's important to also pay attention to how you describe your feelings. So if it's, I am sad, that means you're taking the emotion on as your identity. Does that make sense? So if that's your identity, then you're going to stay stuck in fight fight because this is who you think you are, is that emotion. Mm -hmm. But when you're saying, I feel sad, or I feel anxious, there's a conscious awareness there where it's just like, oh, okay, then that must mean I am not my feelings because feelings come and go, don't they? Right? So as you label your emotions each day, you're calling on your prefrontal cortex to constantly activate, right? So this is where your emotional regulation skills come from, right? Your critical thing, like there's just so many things that you can do. And just by simply labeling emotions, huge world of difference, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two is getting familiar with how the body is in survival state. 
right? Imagine you're in front of a tiger about to die. There's stuff, a lot of stuff happening in your body, isn't there, right? Your heart's beating faster to pump blood faster throughout your system. You're breathing faster to get as much oxygen in your blood flow. Um, your blood's flowing away from your digestive system because yeah. when you're about to die, this is not a time to be eating. <laughs> Guess what? This is like, this is like such a common thing and people who are stressed out all the time is they have digestion issues. Mm -hmm. like, well, it's because you're oh, connected. Probably you're in, you're probably in some survival instinct all the time um, that's causing these digestion issues, and all of these things happen, right? Um, blood flows away from the reproductive organs, so they've done studies with uh, busy working female professionals who want to get pregnant can't get pregnant. As soon right. as the practitioner teaches them how to relax, whether it's meditation or whatever, it's boom, they get pregnant. Because when your body's in survival, this is not a time to be making babies, right? So your body takes all the focus away from there. So it's just a lot of things are happening in your body and it's important to be able to recognize that. You know, a lot of people don't even know their shoulders are scrunched up all the time because they're always stressed, right? Or their muscles are tense all the time because they're right. stressed out all the time. When you're able to identify that more, you're, you know that you're in a survival state. So I don't know if this, uh, I think this is kind of an interesting story if you think about it, is if you imagine a deer out in the woods and it's just eating and drinking, right? It's not in survival. And imagine a tiger shows up, boom, survival instincts are going to kick in and it's going to run away, right? But if you examine what this deer does, imagine it outruns the tiger, the threat is gone. If you watch this deer, you know what it does? It literally shakes off that trauma, kind of like a dog shakes off water, it just goes back to eating and drinking. Like as if nothing's happened, even it almost just died. But humans, for some reason, if we go through the same experience, what happens? We're sitting there going, oh my God, I almost died. <laughs> We're thinking about it for hours, for months, and for years, and we're still talking about it at parties. Remember that time seven years ago, I got attacked by a tiger and I almost died. Wasn't that crazy? We hold on to an experience and we still react to it with the survival response over and over again. Um, so that's what keeps our bodies in the survival state because we, we remember that. That's where implicit memory comes in for survival purposes, but people who hold on to it constantly stay in reaction. So anyway, um, so this is where deep breathing is really important. So two types of breathing that I use uh, that I recommend is one is box breathing, deep inhale for five seconds, hold it for five seconds, breathe out for five seconds, nice and slow, right? And the second one that's really interesting, uh, I learned it from a guy, Andrew Huberman, he's a neuroscientist from Stanford. And where they did these studies, they literally take like an fMRI while they're doing these breathing exercises and you literally watch the parasympathetic nervous system just turn on, uh, is you take a deep inhale, and then you take another deep inhale and then slow breath out. And then that activates your parasympathetic nerves. Why is that? It's because in your diaphragm, guess what's there? It's your parasympathetic nerves. So we're not breathing deep breaths when we're in survival state, when we think we're about to die, we're taking short, shallow, rapid breaths. So when you consciously take these deep breaths, you're signaling to your body, which is the first thing that reacts when it senses danger, what, even if it's emotional danger, uh, you're telling your body like, hey, it's okay. <laughs> like we need, you can calm down, it's okay. So this is why, this, you know, it's cliche. Everyone always talks about taking a deep breath, but that's why it works. Um, so I like to explain that to clients. So it's just not another like, oh, okay. Like I've heard this before, um, but there's real reasons why this works. It's because you're literally doing something in your body when you're taking these deep breaths. Um, so you're activating parasympathetic and that activates your executive state in your brain. Uh, so that's number two. Uh, and number three is simply paying attention to people's nonverbals. You mm. can tell when people's nonverbals are in survival state or- um, yeah or executive state, right? If I'm like scrunched up, skeptical, I'm in survival, I'm getting defensive, right? Are you a con artist? Are you here a threat? Are you not my friend, right? Um, or people who are happy, kids are a perfect example. My kids, you yeah. know, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, they, they all with all the stuff that's been happening last year, they, they're just the happiest they can be because they get to spend so much time with mom and dad, right? <laughs> so um, where this becomes useful is relationships whether it's working relationship or personal relationships, if you see someone's nonverbal is showing you, whoa, this person's in a uh, survival state, because when you're in survival state, your brain's not receptive to information, like conversation, like rational conversation, right? A perfect example is my kids. If my daughter's melting down and I try to lecture her, like, how do you think your brother felt when you hit him? Like, she's not going to compute because she's busy melting down. Yeah. So this is what happens a lot in miscommunication. When a person's in survival state, no matter how much you try to explain something to them, it's not really registering in their brain because they're still surviving from something. So um, what's important here is just being able to understand people's nonverbals. And the strategy there is called connect and redirect. It's a parenting skill. Uh, um, connect and redirect meaning if my daughter's having a meltdown, I need to calm her nerves down first 
So whether that's give her a hug, make sure I, she feels connected to me, right? Like, Hey, like, you know, empathize, right? I, I get why this can be upsetting. I would be upset too, if that happened to me. Uh, and then if they calm down, now their parasympathetic nerves are on, their executive state is on, they can have empathy, they can understand, right? A conversation. Now I can redirect to the conversation that I want to have. Like, how do you think your brother felt when you hit him? Do you think you would have liked that if he hit you X, Y, Z? So that's number three is just practicing that. Pay attention to people's nonverbals and then practice connect and redirect. So this is something great I use for leaders, right? Because leaders are always like, why, do, why don't people get what I'm trying to tell my team or X, Y, Z? I'm like, I can guarantee you there's some sort of survival thing happening in your team, whether it's trust issues or they don't like each other or whatever it is, there's some sort of survival thing happening because they don't feel safe. Um, and tip number four, last one is um, how conversations. Pay attention to the tone and the, the way you speak, right? So a lot of the things that we can say can unknowingly trigger a survival response in people, right? You get defensive. Um, so, you know, in relationships, you hear this type of phrase all the time. It's like accusational, right? Like questions that start with why, why did you do that? Why did you do this? Or leaders that ask it this way, um, or did you do this, right? It sounds accusational. Uh, and then absolute statements. Why do you always do this? Why do you never do that? All of those kinds of questions trigger the fight, flight, freeze response, which is an attack, now becomes an attack and defend conversation. And there's no middle ground. It's just two people attacking each other or trying to defend themselves. And when you're in survival, there's no process of, of the brain, right? Like it's not receiving information as well. So that's another thing I do is just pay attention to the way people speak. Um, how I do this with my entrepreneur clients that I help grow their businesses. They might come up asking me like, what should I say to win the sale? And I know that's a survival question because beneath the surface, what you're really asking me is how do I avoid rejection, shame, right? Uh, from this person not buying from me. Uh, and then that's when we can ask better questions where I, with curiosity, I can ask things like, I don't know, what is your client struggling with? What is the problem that if we help solve for them, it would mean the world to them. And if they don't know the answer, I'm like, great. Now we have clarity on what the right question is, is maybe you should go talk to them and see what they're going through. Then we can determine if it's something you can help them with or not. Then we can have the conversation of providing them a service that they can pay for. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, like that's the kind of neuroscience that I use um, where like all of these nuances, it's kind of right in front of our face, but it's just being able to start developing the eyes to start seeing what's really happening. Uh, and that mindfulness, that awareness is what creates the change. Wow. Yeah. All of those tips when you were saying them, I was like, oh, this is so applicable to being a parent and working with kids and, you know, about naming emotions and asking your kids how they feel at the moment. So to get as one of the ways to also redirect them and reconnect them, um, you know, all of them can be used for any kind of interpersonal or work relationships or parent Absolutely. children or anything like that. So those are some great life tips in general and how to lead a happier, more be an executive of your own life, you know, and yeah, uh, in all areas, really. Yeah. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Right. It's like as kids, you can clearly see when it's a fight, flight, freeze response. Right. Yeah. When they're upset fighting with their brother or their sister, right? They're not hiding it from Correct. us. As adults, we also put on this mask. Adults, we just find more <laughs> adult ways to do it. And we call right. it normal when it's really just a fight, flight, freeze response. Um, right. Yeah. And it's it's kind of shocking on why this is the case. You know, there's been statistics done. 80 to 85% of people when surveyed anonymously in the world reported being disengaged at their jobs. They hate their jobs, right? One in six Americans are on some form of psychiatric medication. Anti, you know, you and I both, both know this, right? We Antidepressants this. are the top prescribed, and um, and anxiolytics, right? Anti-anxiety meds are the second most prescribed, and I I personally think they are way over prescribed, in my opinion. I agree. Um, and people are not just disengaged with their work; they're disengaged with their lives and their bodies and their bodies. And you know, they did other. Oh my gosh, there was this other um, survey that they did. They asked a group of people a simple question. Who's got your back? 60% of them said nobody. And out of the 60%, 55% of those people were married. Wow. So what does this show? It shows that our brains feel unsafe psychologically for many, many different reasons. And when our brain doesn't feel safe, guess what? It feels the need to protect. And how does our brain know how to protect? It's only those three reactive responses, which is fight, flight, freeze. That's all it knows how to do. And if we're in that for a majority of our lives, 
you're not free. You're a slave to the reactive response. This is why no matter how much willpower you use, it feels like it's hard to get out of certain habits or behaviors. And it becomes automatic in your brain. Because by the time we're about 35 years old, 90 to that saying, if you've ever heard it, that we only use 5% of our brains, 10% of our brain. The reason why it's partially true, it's because majority of your brain becomes subconscious by then. It's on autopilot. The things that you think, the things that you believe, we think 70,000 thoughts a day, 90 to 95% of those thoughts are the same thoughts every day. A quarter of those thoughts, some negative thought about yourself. All of this stuff that will trigger fight, flight, freeze response. So the better we're able to see this, the better we're able to start seeing what kind of opportunities, solutions that we have, what kind of gifts that we have that maybe we're not using enough of, all of that good stuff. And that's kind of where the magic happens. Yeah, I love this conversation because, you know, as pharmacists, we see how many pills people are on. And as you said, mental health with anxiety and depression being kind of hand in hand, and people often have both, uh, and how many pharmaceuticals are used and how we're underutilizing simple philosophies like you've just laid out that are backed up by neuroscience and other kind of traditional wisdom. So instead of tapping into that, we're tapping into these band-aids of drugs and other short-term solutions that really aren't um, reflecting long-term health because it's a crutch. You know, once you yep. take it, you have to keep taking it. You're, it's not like you're treating day. the symptom, not the yeah, problem. Yeah, you're treating the symptoms. So I love how what you've laid out and your methodology is treating the upstream, like something way upstream, you yes. know, in your brain that is going to have so many downstream effects on all your systems and affect your mental health, your physical health. Like you said, people with autoimmunity, people with gut issues yep. that are so connected to our central nervous system, um, you know, our enteric nervous system, which I talk a lot about too. And it's just like, if you're targeting something that can be beneficial to every single area of your life, you know, no matter what these people are coming to you for, they're going to get so much out of your services. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll come out and say it. Like, I feel like Western medicine is so behind, like having yeah. been in it, right. From a clinical perspective, I feel like it's so far behind. There's so much evidence and research out there. That's so promising. Um, like both medicinally too, right. Like, you know, I've been looking at the stuff around the psilocybin, right. Like psychedelics. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, and ketamine. I'm like, wow, this is really promising. Cause what you're really doing chemically is just shutting the immune. Yeah, off. and this is for perception. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. you're opening up your awareness and perception. Correct. And like you said about the pain, the emotional versus physical pain. I also wanted to mention it's the perception of the pain too. Like it's the meaning that you're that's, giving an that's experience. The point. Yeah. That's the point. It's you're giving it a certain meaning that might not even be true. Exactly. So anyway, like where it gets really exciting is you know, they did this study, uh, this neuroscientist did this study with a group of piano players. They had the group of piano players play the piano. They were scanning their brains while they were doing it. They had them do a second uh, exercise, which is don't touch the keys, don't play the piano, just imagine playing the piano. If you put those scans side by side, not different. It I read about practically, that. practically yeah. identical. It yeah. means your brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. I mean, as pharmacists, this is why you have clinical studies that have up to 75% placebo effect. Why does that happen? And nocebo too. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is the power of what we're capable of is simply with our imagination, is it possible that your body can experience a difference just simply with your, and the answer is yes. It sounds crazy, right? It took me a long time to wrap my head around all of this, um, but the results speak for itself. It's really the meaning that we're giving experiences in our lives that's holding us back in fight, flight, freeze, and it's preventing us from seeing the bigger picture or, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, this yeah. goes, I'm unloading a lot, I know in this conversation, but like, it goes pretty deep. This is like tip of the iceberg of what we're capable of, but yeah, that's kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I left behind pharmacy twice, even though it was very lucrative and all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a fun journey being able to help people with all this. Yeah. I totally love this conversation and where it went. And I so appreciate your time and sharing your journey and everything you've learned. Well, I'm sure not everything, but, you know, just scratching that tip with, of the iceberg was amazing. And I think it's going to offer a lot of insight. And like you were saying, I think science is always catching up to, you know, how something works, but it doesn't mean that if something does not work, if science has not caught up yet, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes science, yes. 
yeah, we know something works, but we don't believe it until we know how, because that's like our human right. condition. Yeah. So, you know, eventually all the things that we know and we have known <laughs> for generations, now we can actually use the tools that we have because of our technology to make sense of it and embrace it and hopefully change the picture of healthcare and all of that and improve lives. Um, so we're out of time, but I would love to have like a rapid fire round of like two, three questions. Sure. Go for it. Okay. So what's your number one advice for pharmacists or pharmacy students that are looking to, you know, really make an impact and are not happy with their current career options? The number one advice I would give yeah. is seek support. Um, you know, Warren Buffett, there, I'm sure it's widely quoted, right? He always says the most important th thing to invest in is yourself, right? So I would highly encourage if a part of you knows that you're dependent on, you can't outsource your purpose. If you're dependent on your job to give you a sense of meaning in your life, you're going to be in for a long ride. That's going to be a rude awakening because um, think about what's happening when you're in survival state. If you go into the dark woods and you hear an angry growl, of a, some sort of scary animal, where does your focus go? It goes outside of yourself. You're not thinking about inside of yourself, right? You're thinking about outside of yourself. This is what happens when we have these emotions that trigger survival. We think the thing outside of us is where the threat is, where the problem is. Maybe I need a new job. Maybe I need a new relationship. Yeah. Maybe I need that new career. It's important to start with the inner work. It's just like, well, okay, if you're unhappy, like just be aware of that, sit with it, process it, right? Um, and seek support. Coaching is great. Like that's what I do, right? Um, seeking support, getting people in your life to create that safe space for yourself and practice that awareness building of when you're in survival. Because the awareness is what gets you out of it, right? If you have a piece of broccoli in your teeth, how do you remove it unless it comes to your awareness, right? So you won't know how to fix it until you become aware of what the real problem is, which is it's an inside thing going on. So I think that's what I would highly recommend is try to focus less on the outside. Maybe it's this new job I need and try to focus first on what's going on the inside. Then it'll help you figure out the stuff on the outside. I hope that yeah. makes sense. No, it makes That's sense. I'm thinking like the grass is always greener, yeah. but it's always like a perspective and being more in gratitude with what is already going right rather yeah. than focusing on like some one Correct. thing, fixating on something that's going wrong. Yeah, gratitude and fear literally cannot coexist yeah, exactly. in the brain at the same time, yeah. Okay, so second question is, what is your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby? Um, it's changed over the years. These days, it's just learning about all this stuff, right? Like, how do you activate human potential, right? Um, yeah. Both from a, like, I'm, a, I'm like a personal development junkie. Like, I love to learn about how different people do different things. Uh, that, I love food, like good, good food. Um, so that's, that's one thing my wife complains to me about is just like, I love eating out so much, right. And, <laughs> and not eating home cooking as much. Uh, so that's something I love doing in terms of hobbies. Um, yeah, those are my main ones these days in terms of hobbies. Cause otherwise, you know, I got two little ones. So my hands are full, like playing with the kids, which I love doing as well. Um, yeah. And, and doing and this type of work. Yeah. On the, on that note, what's your favorite beverage to drink? My favorite beverage. Um, that's a good question. I haven't really, oh, okay, boba. Um, ah. in, the, in the East Coast, we called it bubble tea, but when I came yes. to the West Coast, everyone here calls it boba. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite drink. Like I always crave that when I don't have it for a while, like a classic milk tea boba. All right, awesome. Well, lastly, I'd love for you to share with the listeners how they can get in touch with you directly, learn more about your work. And if you wanna share um, that you mentioned that you were published or what kind of, um, you know, platforms you usually use to post yeah. articles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of articles, I think if you just Google Dr. Eugene K. Choi, you'll see um, like all my articles that pop up. A lot of them got fortunate to be SEO, like, you know, top results and all that kind of stuff. Um, otherwise, I have a website. It's destinyhacks.co, uh, <laughs> not .com, because right now it costs a ridiculous amount of money to get to .com, but it's .co. Uh, and you can just email me if you have questions. It's eugene at destinyhacks.co. And um, otherwise, if you're on a commute, you want to listen to me uh, present kind of stuff, uh, I have a podcast that I just launched. It's called the Neurohacking Podcast. And you can find it on all the uh, platforms like Spotify, Apple, all that good stuff. 
Awesome. I'll definitely be looking out for that and I'll post everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today with us. And I look forward to learning from you in the future. Yeah. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. All right. Take care of yourself. Bye. Bye now.